All right, so we, uh, we are going to toggle back and forth between your live questions and those that were asked online. Um, so who would like to go first? I'll go with him, then you. Don't be selfish. <laughs> right there? Okay. Hi, Andy. Bob, Mark. Um, is this working? Because I'm getting no feedback on it. Okay. Um, this is more direct towards Mark and a little convoluted. Uh, some of the things you were talking about earlier as far as interest, funding, and so on, and predictions. Uh, couldn't the approach of a, a POTHIS in about, what, 10, 12 years from now, making two runs around us? I know that's been lowered in probability of possibly hitting us to, like, last I heard, one in 250,000 or something like that. But still, wouldn't that be visible enough and close enough, especially as it's going to do a loop, that... Uh, you could sponsor a whole new career on that one? Well, it's certainly <laughs> going to be the subject of a lot of really intense observations. So we know for a fact, based on previous observations, uh, very, very, very precise ones, that it is not going to hit during its next close approach. And we also know for a fact that it is not going to be deflected to an impact the second time around. And uh, further close approaches in the future, though, cannot be completely ruled out, in part because of these close approaches to the Earth. You know, if it's just a little off in one direction or another, that changes the, the force of gravity of the Earth on it, which deflects it more or less. So the, uh, the position gets much more uncertain the fur further into the future you go. But observations at that time, during the close approach, the first one coming up, will absolutely nail down its position and velocity, so we will have, we will probably eliminate the possibility of an impact for a thousand years or so. Now, regarding visibility, I think what's really cool, the one coming up in the late 2020s, it's going to be so close to us that it's going to be visible to the naked eye. Wow. Yeah. What, what is the mass of that one that you just talked about, Apophis? I believe it's about a kilometer across. I, I don't know what the mass of that would be, but it's going to be millions, billions of tons. So it's a substantial size that would cause regional damage should it hit. But it's not going to on the, either these first two passes. I know that there's been a, a couple, uh, not close calls, but close drive-bys by comets where we've gotten up early to go see them at the Adler and then, oh, no, sorry, it burned up in the sun <laughs> or something like that. Is, is that possible with this where it'll just... it's telling us it'll be close and then the day comes and we're sorely disappointed? Right, right. Uh, probably not in this case because asteroids, uh, for the most part, are, are rocky objects. Uh, and they, uh, we, we call them asteroids because they don't show any signs of vaporization when they get close to the sun. Now, uh, there was a recent comet, Comet Ison, a few years ago, that uh, ISON, uh, passed very close to the sun and it was heated up very, very strongly and actually was com it completely flew apart. So comets can do that. They, they often do that. Asteroids would not. So it's not going to fly off or anything. It'll, we'll, we'll see it. Yeah, we, we will definitely see, yeah. Great. And it'll be a really cool event at the Adler in the late 2020s, yeah. I'm excited, yes. We have one online. Uh, what are some of your favorite, more scientifically accurate films? Well, I presume that you're talking about science fiction now only, um, or... Not documentaries. I, I'm a huge fan of The Hunt for Red October. And that's... How many people have seen The Hunt for Red October? Okay, I think it's one of the greatest movies ever made in that genre. Um, I'm a huge fan of Enemy of the State, starring Will Smith and John Voight. And that one is pretty accurate, although they exaggerate some of the surveillance capabilities of the NSA. They're not terribly exaggerated. Enhance though. or enlarge, enhance, sort of zoom in, enhance, yes. that sort of thing? Yes. They, they make it so that it's so easy for them to get any information they want when, in fact, it's actually very difficult, and there's lots of problems with that. Um, there's a movie called The Conversation with Gene Hackman. It was made back in 1974. Most of you probably never even heard of it. 
you have, yeah, the older folks. Yeah. yeah, it dealt with surveillance technology, and so it was really an interesting surveillance movie. It had a lot of impact on me. I think there should be a great surveillance scene in every single script. Okay, so that's, I, I'm obsessed Lord with surveillance. Of the Rings. <laughs> surveillance. Yeah, electronic surveillance by the FBI. I, the, one of the best scripts I ever wrote was a, a spy movie called Counter Intel. It never got made, unfortunately. Um, we, it's, a, it's about FBI surveillance teams following Chinese spies in San Francisco, essentially, to boil it down to one sentence. And it had the best surveillance scene ever. We, we concocted, I was working with an actual FBI agent who had taught surveillance at the FBI Academy, among other things, and we concocted the most difficult surveillance scenario that the agents could ever, ever face. And then we had our agents, you know, prevail in spite of the fact that the target switched modes of transportation five times in the course of the surveillance, which makes it incredibly difficult to follow the guy. But they managed it, and they followed him to a key meeting, and they, they uncovered a Chinese spy ring because of their successful surveillance. Mark, your favorite? Yeah, boy, hard, hard to pick out a favorite. Uh, talking about asteroids, I, I liked Deep Impact quite a bit, and there were a couple parts that Maybe not an expert, uh, an expert, uh, only an expert would, uh, would notice. Uh, there's one part where they're, the astronauts are making a flyby, a, a slingshot effect past the Earth so they can get back to the comet. And, um, oh gosh, what's the, what's the actor's name? But he's leading the expedition, the old grizzled astronaut. That's and he Robert says, Moore. we're, we're passing, passing perigee right now. We're never going to be closer ho to home than we, uh, uh, again. Uh, and yeah, just that, that, that correct use of the term perigee was, was pretty cool. Uh, little things. And the little things like that I appreciate, yeah. But I'll tell you, I'll turn the question around a little bit. You know what I appreciate even more than scientific accuracy of all of the details? I, I like self-consistency. And an example I like to use in that regards is Ghostbusters, right? Okay. It's, a, it's not scientifically accurate, okay? But it doesn't matter. It all hangs together. Don't cross the streams. Why? It would be bad. <laughs> you don't have to. And they never try to explain that, fine. right? That's fine. fine. And that works. It's the movies where they work, well, it's because of the plasma is magnetized, and they throw in all kinds of mumbo jumbo. That's when it doesn't work for me. Here's a trap. Yep, it works. It catches ghosts, right? Yeah, okay. sure. What's your favorite UFO movie of all time? Holy moly. Uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh my gosh, what a brilliant movie. So perfectly captures the, the, the zeitgeist, uh, the, the, the feeling of the early to mid 70s. Perfectly, perfectly. I, I know I probably wasn't asked, but Galaxy Quest. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it over here? I wanted funny. to ask a question. You did? Okay, uh, okay. as you know, I'm like a huge fan of this movie, and like we elaborated on that earlier. Um, I just have one question. There's like a part where Steve Buscemi is like going crazy, and he has like a minigun, and then someone, like I think it's the captain of the astronauts, is like, he is space dementia. Like, can you like elaborate on that? Because like me and my friends had no idea what he was talking about, and I'm just wondering if that's even like a thing. Thank you. Uh you're going to need to say that again because I couldn't hear exactly. Space what he dementia. Yeah, like he says he's got, he's oh, like, I got, like, like the, the captain's like, you have space dementia. Like, and apparently makes you crazy or something. I don't know. Like, is that a real thing? No, just, 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 just made up. <laughs> Can you tell me if that was in the original script? It was not. Oh, good. <laughs> good, good. Because I do I know. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that, that part indeed. I was hoping to mention that because. That comes up out of nowhere, right? It's like, why is he going nuts, right? And then the, he's got space dementia. <laughs> I'm thinking what? maybe they, they tried to do a play on, uh, for scuba divers, for those who scuba dive, there's a thing called uh, nitrogen narcosis. Where, thank you, nine head. Okay, good. Um, where if, uh, yeah, I don't know the science behind it, sorry. Nitrogen narcosis happens in the water. Well, something like that has got to happen up in space, so. I'm thinking maybe that's, that's what they were trying to go for. Okay, do you think Armageddon helped or hurt the rise of science and mainstream culture? I, I think it helped. Well, I, I don't quite know how to take that question, but 
as I said, it helped them get funding to look for near-Earth asteroids, and that was really important. I don't think it had any impact on people's understanding of science because nobody takes the movie seriously, like Mark, right? I mean, nobody tries to, they don't use it instead of a physics class. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I would agree, because uh, it uh, really, movies like Armageddon and Deep Impact, regardless of their, their scientific accuracy, they raise public awareness of what is a genuine threat. And people, after they see these movies, they might, uh, might go home and, you know, go online and read some more about that and say, hey, you know, this is actually a problem. Let me talk to my members of Congress about this. And it was indeed in, in the late 1990s when funding really took off for near-Earth asteroid studies for surveys, these kinds of things. They were running at budgets of a, a few million dollars a year, supporting all the programs over the world. And there, for a period of years, it was doubling almost every year, or every couple of years, going up to five million, to 10 million, to 20 million, to 50 million. The president's proposed budget in 2019 now, whether it goes through Congress or not, allocates 150 million for near-Earth object studies. Has he seen Armageddon? I wouldn't be surprised. But you don't need that much, right? I mean, the problem is essentially solved. The problem is solved only for the really big ones. It's the small ones, which are vastly still unknown. Uh, this is a bit of whimsy, but uh, <clears throat> being an old guy, the sci-fi movies, there's a ton of them that came out in the 1950s. It, them. Uh, they all these kinds of names, giant ants, this, that, and the other, and the, the day the earth stood still, and war of the worlds. Did any of these movies have any kind of efficacy in science other than popcorn? Day of the Earth Stood Still. I, I actually know the screenwriter of that, Ed North. Or I, I did know him. Ed, Ed has passed away. But um, he was president of the Writers Guild at one point. I got to know him at the Writers Guild. And we had a great little talk about that movie, which I think is a great movie. In fact, I would nominate it along with Close Encounters as... True. the greatest UFO movie ever. It's scientifically pretty accurate. I mean, there's not much science in it, but that's the one where a UFO lands on the White House lawn, basically. And, and the robot comes out, and they shoot at it, and it turns out to be invulnerable, and then the guy comes out, and he, he wants to deliver his message of peace and no nukes. There you go. The, yeah, the day the Earth stood still is really interesting uh, from uh, my interest in flying saucers and UFOs. Came out in what, 1951, something seven, like that. Seven, I think, seven or eight. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but but it came out early enough, and it turns out it had a seminal impact on the flying saucer mythology. So you've got this you know, this, this handsome humanoid guy step out, and that really kind of set the tone for. The, I would say the mythology, the stories about flying saucers, it set off what's, what's known as the contactee movement, that uh, people were being contacted in the desert, that flying saucer would come and land, and beautiful humanoids from the planet Venus would come out. And that absolutely dominated the field of UFOs and UFO reports into the 1960s. Where, at which point things changed, uh, and we've moved on to different kinds of aliens. But yeah, for the longest period of time, they were beautiful humanoid space brothers who were coming to warn us about impending doom from nuclear weapons or you know threats to nature. So yeah, that movie was just so influential in that. And it did have an impact in science, too. That whole, that whole movement, fly, the flying saucer movement, it led to... I think, a giggle factor when con talking about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. NASA had a big program that was ready to go in the early 1990s using Arecibo to look for radio transmissions. And because of this, you know, oh, you're looking for aliens, what, what, the, the giggle factor, members of Congress shut that down at the last minute. They cut funding after years of planning. Literally, there was a senator from Nevada standing up and waving around a tabloid saying, why are we spending millions of dollars on this when we can go to the supermarket and get evidence of it? Literally happened on the floor of Congress. And I knew a guy, I just started graduate school. He'd been hired as a postdoc to work on that program, moved to Seattle with his family. He had his funding cut out from under him. He had no job with no warning at all. He left the field of astronomy as a result. That's sad. You kind of hit on this already, but uh, what real technologies does NASA possess to potentially divert or destroy the asteroid? 
an asteroid today? So there's, there's, there's a lot of thought about what to do about that. And one of, the, one of the classic proposals that came out in the 1990s was to, well, was to use nukes. And uh, rather than just try to fragment it completely, you know, because then you get a shotgun blast instead of a solid slug, is set off a bomb or something next to it so it nudges, maybe blasts some dust off the surface, nudges it away. But that's only good if you have a long, long lead time. The folks at Livermore Lab, that's the nation's premier nuclear weapons design lab uh, back in the 1990s, including Edward Teller, uh, the father of the H-bomb, he had this idea, proposed it at a conference I was at, that we develop and test new nuclear weapons that were so powerful they could vaporize incoming asteroids. So we're talking nuclear H-bombs with yields of a billion tons of energy, of TNT equivalent. That's 20 times more powerful than the most insanely powerful bomb ever tested on the Earth. And during the course of the conference, he had a better idea. We use one of these really, really big bombs to deflect a giant asteroid and use that asteroid, almost like a billiard ball, to smack into another incoming thing so we could protect the Earth against truly large impacts like the 600-mile-wide asteroid. So, yeah, the answer was bigger and bigger bombs. Nowadays, thoughts are, well, maybe we'll impact it with something and just nudge it off course a bit. There's a space mission that's going to fly in a few years called DART. It's going to impact a moon of an asteroid. And it's a physics experiment, basically. And then there's something else they call a gravity tractor, which is a cool idea. You know, anything with mass has gravity. So fly a spacecraft next to an asteroid and thrust it away from the asteroid just enough that it's the, the spacecraft, the minute, minute gravity from the spacecraft tugs the asteroid off course. Lots of thoughts, no development so far. Um, I have a one science geared question that is um, how you feel about the privatization of space travel and um, with leaders like Peter Diamandis who are asp have aspirations to mining <laughs> formations in space. Does that help or hurt your cause? And then real quick for writer, um, since you guys have this ability to create awareness um, for the world, basically, how do you handle that responsibility and how does that motivate you um, for future projects? Mark, let's start with you first. Yeah, so I, I am absolutely for the private space, space flight industry. I, I think that's it's fantastic that we've got individuals who are interested in doing this. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's great. It's got to be complemented by by federal efforts, by NASA efforts, right? All of these things, SpaceX, that kind of stuff, they are not exploration agencies. NASA is an exploration agency. That's, that's their, that their chief mission, right? So we need both of those. Um, as for asteroid mining and uh, other efforts, like you know, sending people to live on Mars, there's no way that this is going to be cost uh, effective or even return any, you know, uh, get any return on the investment for a long, long, long time in the future. And so what that's going to rely on are these eccentric billionaires who can afford to just throw money at the problem. And, you know, heck, I'm, I'm for that as well. Because uh, anything that helps humans get out into space, in my idea, is, is a good idea. Now, you can spend money on other humanitarian efforts, right? But it's just one piece of the pie. There's a lot of room for other people to work on it. Yeah, Jeff Bezos with Amazon and Blue Origin. Yep. Go ahead. Okay, the, your, the question was about our social awareness when we, when we do our writing projects, when we create writing projects. Okay, for me, it's all important. Uh, for me, I don't want to work on topics that are just kind of socially irrelevant because I'm bored with it, and I don't think it'll have much impact. I was fortunate that two of my projects really had a lot of impact. Outbreak really alerted certain people to the threat of infectious disease, and the Center for Disease Control appeared on the cover of US News and World Report two weeks after Outbreak was released. So it suddenly got the attention of the journalists, who then did a story about the CDC. And then that probably got the attention, I hope it got the attention, of the lawmakers in Washington, who maybe increased funding for infectious diseases, and maybe stepped up the surveillance. Because what happened with both Outbreak and Armageddon is, the people, the scientists who really do the work, who really protect us, they got more money to do surveillance. And surveillance of infectious diseases is just as important as surveillance of, of asteroids. 
and they got more money to look and react quickly when a new infectious disease emerges. And so far, you know, in the last 20 years, we haven't had any global pandemics of, of flu even. And we could at any point, but the, you know, the way the CDC reacts is so fast now, and the, and the World Health Organization also. So those, those movies actually had a positive impact. So I'm looking for topics where the movie can have a positive impact if it gets made. Now, it's so hard to get anything through the Hollywood system. It's so hard. It, everything turns to drivel. Especially if you're not a sequel or a reboot. Right. And so one of the reasons I wanted to work with Sanford is he's got an idea about, it's about a group of guys who are real knowledgeable about computers and about election machines. And they figure out how to rig the vote in a presidential election. So it's, it's a very socially relevant, of course, we know that nothing like that could ever happen in the real world, <laughs> don't we? Don't we? Um, so it's a very relevant topic. What if somebody could actually rig the results in a presidential election, and how would they do it? I mean, we have to get into some detail about how you would go about doing that and how it would work. And if you can do that in a convincing way, I think it could have an impact on people. And so maybe then the public would react and the politicians would react and say, we have to protect our voting machines and make sure they're not tampered with, or even better yet, do what we do in California and put every vote on a piece of paper. So we have, we have the old punch card system in California, or at least many places in California, not everywhere. You punch a card, and then that card stays in the box when it's done. So if they had to go through and do a recount, they could literally go through and pull those cards out and count them one by one by one and get an accurate count, make sure they had an accurate count. So we've got to make sure that the voting process in this country is solid. And there have been a lot of rumors. You guys have heard them about some vote tampering in the 2016 election. All unproved, all unproved, but still, just think about it. How, how terrible would it be if we had a president who wasn't really elected by the American people? Think about it. <laughs> Here's a really important question. Is the donut from Stan's Donuts? <laughs> I, I forget. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got it off of a Google image search. <laughs> Try harder next time, get a Chicago donut. <laughs> We have so many options. Okay, Michael Bay didn't direct The Martian, thank heavens. Who would be the best director for a science-based film? James Cameron? James Cameron has done really well with science, a lot of different genres. He's done, he did extremely well with the Titanic, Avatar. I mean, he's made a lot of excellent movies. So he would probably be the best of anybody, but just you know, getting him interested in the topic, because he's off in his own little world. Right now he is, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, God, somebody who's not off in their own little world. Uh, microphone. Who? Microphone. Microphone. Oh, microphone. microphone. <laughs> I am just trying to think of a young director. I mean, one of the things that's happened in Hollywood is th the younger directors don't really have a lot of cachet anymore, because their big success is to do one of these Marvel comic book movies. And they do them, but they don't really make much of a reputation for having done them. Does anybody know the name of the director of the Avengers? Okay. Brothers. Who? Brothers. Not the Avengers. Not the original one. The original. Huh? Are the original Avengers in 2009? Yeah. I know someone who knows them. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so there are people who know the name of the director. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course, awesome. of course, of course. One of the things that I found out 20 years ago about directors was that you could go to most multiplexes in this country and you could ask the people coming out of a movie, could they remember the name of the director? And in less than 10% of the people coming out of a movie they'd just seen could even name the name of the director who directed that picture. So the <clears throat> directors today are kind of anonymous. They don't really have a lot of, of cachet anymore. Now, I'm, I'm actually working with Ridley Scott on something. He's still got... People have heard of Ridley Scott, right? Yeah. Oh. Do, do, you, do you know what he's done? Everything. Okay, what else? Blade yes. What else? What was his biggest success at the box office? With? I'll give you a hint. It had Russell Crowe in it. <laughs> that was his biggest success at the box office, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's done some good movies. He's done some real turkeys too, but. <laughs> Well, all right, so people have heard of Ridley Scott, so maybe, you know, I, I would say Ridley Scott is a guy I would want to work with. I, to be fair, Joss Whedon's pretty well known. Firefly. And, uh, yeah, Joss, Joss Whedon's pretty good. And he did, uh, everybody knows that he did the TV series, right? Which one? Okay, that's just a little pop quiz. <laughs> okay, for the film students. All right, so yeah, he's a guy, I mean, I thought he did a terrific job with the Avengers. I thought he did just a terrific job, but I don't think he got a lot of cachet out of it. Because when you do those comic book movies, it's kind of, it's a big industrial system, you know? And I don't think it's really, it really helps the directors that much. Anyway. Mark, did you have a, a pick for director? Yeah, I, I think Ron Howard would be an excellent choice. He yeah. did Apollo 13. That's right, love that movie. One of yeah. the best science-oriented movies ever. Uh, this is for... Dr. Hammergren, um, we talked a little bit about Neil deGrasse Tyson and like the science in the media. How do people in your community view people like Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and their roles in bringing science into like the mainstream media? Yeah, so I've talked about myself being an astronomer and researching asteroids. That's not what I spend most of my time doing at the Adler. I, I'm a science communicator. So not only do I talk about my own work and, and asteroids, other things I have direct experience about, but also general things in astronomy, other subjects that I have uh, knowledge on. And I, I work in general to help people understand not only the, you know, some of the facts of science, but that, that's what's not what science is about. It's about the process of science, the importance of science, what, uh, what people need to be paying attention to. So we deeply appreciate people who are effective science communicators. And, and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye, these kinds of folks, very effective in that respect. What I, and I, I'll, I'll follow that up with, what I don't like um, about some of them, um, and I won't name any names, but they are very willing to be talking heads on subjects that they have absolutely no experience on. Uh, I remember sitting in an airport coming back from a science conference when uh, the uh, Fukushima earthquake uh, happened and the coverage uh, that was going on. And they needed some, uh, CNN needed some experts to talk about, you know, nuclear plants, uh, safety and that kind of thing. They got a couple of these well-known talking heads on there who were not nuclear engineers. You know, they were maybe astronomers or planetary scientists once upon a time. But, you know, you, you have to be willing to stand down and say, no, get somebody who really knows about this. You don't you just do it to get your face out there. We have uh, time for one more question. Who wants to be that lucky person? Nick. So speaking of science and the future, <clears throat> you're talking about movies. What's the future of movies? Going to a cineplex versus sitting at home watching it on your cell phone or whatever. What's going? What What do you see as visionaries? What I see is something I don't understand. Um, Netflix has become this behemoth in the in the movie business and for the last 10 years, I mean, I, I invested in Netflix and made a little bit of money and then I finally got out and said, surely the major studios will crush this little company, right? Surely the six major studios are gonna crush them because throughout the history of the motion picture business, they have always controlled their own distribution. That's been the key to their survival. The six companies that have survived. Now there's many others that came and went and didn't survive, like RKO Radio, Radio Pictures, which made King Kong, which was a great, uh, it made a series of great movies, including King Kong. And Orion Pictures, where my good friend Chris worked uh, for 10 years in the 1980s. Um, Orion Pictures didn't survive, uh, but there are six, companies that did survive, and I figured they will crush Netflix. They will absolutely put it out of business by controlling their own distribution electronically, and they have not done that. This does not make any sense to me. Please explain how. <laughs> what, I, what I see is, is an oligopoly or even a kind of monopoly situation, a virtual monopoly developing in the distribution of motion pictures. I don't know how much longer we're going to go see them at theaters 
you know, TVs have gotten so much better. The ability to download movies has gotten so much better. Why not just watch them at home on your big screen? And in which case, Netflix is going to be absolutely dominant in distribution. And that's going to be bad for the artists. Anytime you have a situation where there's no competition, it's bad for the artists. They can just dictate terms to the writers and the directors and say, take it or leave it. It's not going to be good for us. And I don't know why someone is not doing something about this. Well, I can maybe uh, throw my two cents in. Uh, I don't know if anybody in the audience has heard of Red Letter Media. Um, they're a great uh, YouTube... Uh, I don't want to say podcasters, what are they called? Anyway, uh, they critique movies. Uh, they're great. They also go in on talk about how there is a decline in going to the cinema. And it's because there's these big popcorn movies that are the reboots, that are the sequels. And you go there, and that's, that's what you go to the cinema for. If you want to go see a good movie, something that will make you think, something that will bring tears to your eyes, that's going to be something that you're going to go home and see because you don't want to be interrupted by screaming babies and people talking and candy wrappers. And so that was their take on the downfall of the movie theater. Um, and, I mean, we just saw Netflix win how many Emmys uh, this past week? They... They're, they're award winners now, and yeah, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think Netflix is going anywhere. I think people are going to be watching these movies at home, but maybe for the summer blockbusters, and especially with ticket prices going up astronomically all the time, what's well, like $50 for two, two people to go see a movie? It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it depends. I mean, just uh, Saturday night, maybe, you go, and get, go to get tickets, you pay for the parking, you maybe get a small popcorn, a small drink. Yeah. So I'm very worried about the survival of the theaters and the survival of competition in the motion picture business. And if, if we don't, if competition doesn't survive, it's going to be really bad for the artists. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. All right. Thank you so much, uh, everyone.